Good morning, everyone. We welcome you all to Fardale Trinity Church. We're so happy that you've joined us on this beautiful Sunday morning to worship the Lord and fellowship together. And we ask that as you make your way to your pews that you would rise with us as we read this morning's call to worship reading from Psalm 111, 4 through 5. And it says, The Lord has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for what this psalmist says, that you are gracious, you're compassionate, you are loving God, and you are eternal God. And we just thank you for your love, for your grace and mercy and compassion. You are God, our provider and sustainer. You are giver of all things. We thank you that we have this opportunity this morning to express our gratitude and love to you in worship and praise. We just pray that everything we say and do would bring you honor and glory this morning. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all worship the Lord together with our voices. commands all the hosts of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what other beauty demands such praises what other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out.
you for this day, for all that you've given to us, for the blood, the blood that you shed through your son, Jesus. Lord, you are good. And Lord, may we seek to reflect you 
to reflect your goodness to others. Heavenly Father, on this day, we come before you. You've prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. David said that in Psalm 23. Father, today we, we will come to that table. May our hearts be in the right place. May our thoughts be to you. And may our desire be to bring others to this table through your work in our lives as we reach out to others. Thank you for this day and an opportunity to come here and worship and sing and praise. May we glorify you today and every day beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Fardell family. It is good to see you on this beautiful first Sunday in May. Uh, the Lord is good. Uh, spring is here. It's a beautiful day, not only outside, but just the opportunity for us to join our hearts together in worshiping of our great God. We're so glad that you're here. We have the privilege this morning to um, observe one of the two ordinances of the local church that Jesus has commanded us to do. And so we meet um, in communion around the Lord's table. And this is something that Jesus himself instituted at that last Passover meal when he met with his disciples in the Last Supper and uh, as he shared what these elements are all about, they are meaningful to us as well as we look back on his sacrifice for us. If you'd like to participate and you did not receive one of the communion crackers and cups, you can even get up right now and go back to the table and get one if you'd like to participate. Just a reminder, um, we're about to partake of the bread and the cup that are symbols of Jesus' body and his blood that was shed for us to pay for our sins. Um, you, you cannot receive salvation by ingesting these elements. I know that you understand that, but sometimes people get confused and think that this is the means to salvation. No, it's not. It's really just a beautiful picture that the Lord tells us to remember what he's already done in accomplishing our salvation, when he went to the cross, paid for our sins, and said to Telestai, it is finished, it's all done, it's all paid for. Now we have the opportunity to remember what he's done. And so we, before we partake, I just want to read briefly for you these verses in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul remembered the teaching of the Lord about the communion table. He says in verse 23, I receive from the Lord that which I also am now delivering to you, that the Lord Jesus on that night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we're told by the Lord that the reason we do this is to remember him and to remember his great sacrifice on our behalf for our sin, which we could not pay for ourselves. So we look back to what he accomplished, but notice what else Paul says that Jesus told his disciples, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, when you observe communion, you're proclaiming the victory of the Lord's death and resurrection when? Until he comes again. So we also look forward that when he comes again and takes us home to be with him, we will celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb with him in heaven. And then there's one final aspect that is a good benefit of meeting around the Lord's table. It's called self-examination. Paul said, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will actually be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Therefore, when you come to communion, let a person examine himself and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 
We've designed our time today for all of us to be able to do that. It is good to take time to quiet our hearts, meditate on God's sacrifice for us, think about His coming again, but also examine our lives. If there's something in your life that's coming between you and God, simply take this time to confess it to Him. Name the sin. Name the shortcoming. Say, God, you brought this to my mind. And I want to confess this before you, and I want to make it right with you because I love you. I know you already paid for the sin, and I need your help to overcome it. That's what self-inspection is all about, so that our lives are actually honoring the very reason why he gave his life for us, not only to deliver us from the penalty of our sin, but also to help us overcome the practice of sin, all because of what Jesus did for us. So here's what we're going to do. Um, If you have the bread and the cup, remember that there's kind of two folds that you need to peel back, one to reveal the cracker and one to reveal the cup. We're going to take a few moments now to just quietly bow our heads, pray, talk to the Lord, meditate. Donnie's going to be playing some music that will softly uh, give us an opportunity to just talk to the Lord quietly. Let's do that for a few moments and then we'll partake together. At that last supper, Jesus took the bread and he told his disciples after he had given thanks and broke it, and he said to them, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. He also, in the same way, took the cup at the end of supper and holding the cup before them he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood this you are to do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me let's partake together would you pray with me father god we remember the sacrifice of your son No one else could have accomplished what he did. No one else was worthy as the Holy One without sin to become the perfect sacrifice for our sin. He took our sins in his body on the tree. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had given us a dark, dark spot on our lives, but you cleansed it all white as snow. And we now stand forgiven justified, declared righteous in your sight because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Accepting your free gift of salvation and eternal life has given us not only victory over our past sin, but the promise that you sanctify us, you continue to make us into the image of your Son, you can give us victory over the uh, practice of sin in our lives, and that one day you will give us victory from the very presence of sin when we are glorified together with you. Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. We love you, and we want our lives to count for you as changed people by the grace of God who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. These things we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you stand together with me? One of the benefits of meeting around the Lord's table 
is to remember not only do we have a bond with Jesus our Savior, but we have a bond of love as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ because he is in us and we can share that love with each other. So let's take some time right now to greet one another. You might want to give a holy hug or handshake or just a nice smile. You can also use this time to give the offering boxes are in the back. Let's take some time to fellowship and greet one another. And why don't we all return to our pews and rise to sing the family of God because that's who we are. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joy dares with Jesus as we travel this for I'm part of the family, the family of God. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody, and again, welcome to Fardell Trinity Church. We're glad that you've chosen to come and worship with us. On this first Sunday of May, a beautiful day to come and worship the Lord together in his house. So we're glad that you're here and chosen to worship with us this morning. Just a couple of reminders before we get into our regular announcements. You can always follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We have our, our social media sites are up and running throughout the week. You get news of the church through that and updates. Uh, also, uh, we stream our sermon continually through uh, Facebook as well on Sundays. Also, any questions or anything, 
You can always go to our website. Our schedules and calendars are out there along with a lot of the sign-up sheets and forms are also out there. And again, if you need anything throughout the week, feel free to email Pastor Lee or Pastor Mike or give the church office a call or stop on by. They're here throughout the week and uh, we're happy to help wherever we can. Hopefully when you came in this morning, you saw the great results of our day of service. The, uh, the grounds have been spruced up. Uh, I heard the front door look right. I came in the side today, so I'm going to have to go out the front uh, to see how it looks. I heard it looks awesome. So thanks for all those who served yesterday uh, here at the church and in the community, helping to spruce up the grounds for spring and make our church look awesome and welcoming to all those passing by uh, in our community. A couple of, uh, of announcements coming up. So the ladies' uh, spring brunch is coming up. It's going to be Saturday, May 14th, so it's only two Saturdays away in Fellowship Hall from 10 to noon. There are sign-up sheets in the back. Sign up to be there and also sign up to help uh, ahead of time. So if you're interested and you'd like to attend, we encourage you please to sign up so we know how many um, you know, little uh, teacups to set out and things like that. And also, if you'd like to help out, there's an opportunity to help. If you have any questions, you can, of course, uh, reach out to Kristen or the church office to see how you can help out and see what kind of help we need there during the Ladies' Spring Brunch. But that's only uh, two Saturdays from now, so start to pray for this. Uh, as an event for our church, for our church ladies uh, this spring. Of course, it'll be color coordinated and all those great things, uh, so we encourage all the ladies to attend. Also, we have a, uh, the following Saturday, we'll be partnering with one of our ministry partners. So Star of Hope has been a ministry partner of our church for decades. We see Pastor Matt uh, throughout the year. He comes and speaks to us at men's events. He comes into this morning service once in a while. Uh, pastor Matt Anderson uh, is their executive director and, and a pastor of some local churches. Uh, and Star of Hope, again, is our, one of our main ministry partners. They've been with us for decades, and they're local. So we can get involved with them. We don't have to ship ourselves out to some foreign land. Uh, Patterson is 10 miles away. It, they're literally our neighbors in our community here. Uh, so Saturday, the 21st of, of May, if you'd like to do so, please sign up. Uh, we come here at Fardell 8.30. We'll serve from about 9 to noon. We'll get, we'll get you back for lunch. We'll get you back so you can get to your own to-do list. But you can also take care of some of the work that Star of Hope needs for us. So it's a great opportunity to serve. Not a lot of heavy lifting. You don't have to have any special skills to do this. Just a love of the Lord, a love uh, for our community in Patterson and our neighbors in Patterson that we can help out. Uh, so we encourage you to sign up and show up on Saturday, May 21st as well. It's only in the morning. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to come in and dip your toe into the service pool, into the missions pool with one of our ministry partners. So we encourage you to do, sa to do that and pray for that outreach as well. Also, it's garage sale time again. So it's time to come out. It's going to be a Saturday, uh, a Friday and Saturday, June 3rd and June 4th, uh, all day, both days. We'll also have our car wash as we usually do. Uh, but we have a lot of opportunities to help. You can see them out here uh, throughout. So we're going to start collecting uh, saleable things. So this is not an opportunity to clean out all the junk in your house. But if you have saleable stuff that you don't use anymore, we're going to start collecting that uh, on Sunday, May 29th after church. So it's only the week ahead of time uh, to drop it off in Fellowship Hall. We also have a lot of opportunities to help, right, where you can, you can help set up the week before. You can do some pricing. We have time to uh, help on the, that Friday and Saturday. If you're into the social media thing, you're one of them hip folks that can do more than just what I do. I take a picture of it, and then I post it on my Facebook feed. If you're better than that, there's opportunities to help with social media, All right? because that's the bulletin board of today, right? You don't post it at work anymore. You don't post it in the grocery store anymore. Everything goes out on social media. If you'd like to make donations for the bake sale, for the hospitality table, there's going to be sign-ups in the lobby, again, in the foyer. You'll see sign-ups out there. We'll also start putting out these sign-ups uh, in the weekly email that come from Pastor Lee and Pastor Mike throughout the week. Uh, continue to pray for this. Start praying for this as it comes up. And this helps us support some of our uh, ministry partner graduates, right? So we support Hosein International Ministries. It's a K-12 through program in uh, Haiti. And then this is for some of those kids that are able to go to college. And then we pay for their college tuition. Now you're like, wow, college tuition. That must be a lot. Right? Like I, got a, I got a daughter going to college next year. It's a lot in America, but in Haiti, it's relatively uh, inexpensive. So we can pay a full tuition. We can pay a full fees. We can pay for full supplies for one or two students all year long just from the benefits from the, from the garage sale. So the, the money goes a long way. and makes a huge difference in the lives of these couple of kids that we're able to support. So come out, sign up, 
find all the stuff in your house you want to sell. Maybe you got that closet. Maybe you got that drawer. Maybe you've got that dreaded basement like we have that has all this stuff that we really don't use that we're not willing to part with quite yet. Well, this is your chance to part with it. So sign up to help. Pray for this ministry. Pray, pray for this event. And then pray for the money is put to good use. So now we're putting Christian kids through college in Haiti, and then they get jobs in the government, in the community in Haiti, and have a, a lasting impact in Haiti, which is the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, bar none. It's the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, and we have an impact there through Hosean and through these, these outreaches that we have with these students. So it's a great opportunity to, again, just live and, and love beyond Fardell Trinity Church, to be God's hands and feet, not here in our, just in our community, but in Patterson with Star of Hope and in Haiti with Jose and in the ministries we have there. So we encourage you to get involved some way in this. There's lots of opportunities to get involved in it, anywhere from prayer to being there to helping to set up to donating stuff to it. There's a lot of opportunities to do that and be involved. At this time, I'm going to have John come up. He's going to do this morning's scripture. First John. 3, 16 through 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. Please bow with me in prayer. Lord God, you've given us a direction. You've told us to love our brothers and sisters. You've given us a, a road map the possessions that we have, the stuff that becomes junk. You call us, Lord, to shut ourselves of those things that so easily beset and hold us back from ministering, from being godly, from following you. Yet, Lord, we hold on to these things. Heavenly Father, when Jesus was asked, who is my neighbor? Well, who is my brother and sister in some respects? His response was the downtrodden. His response was the parable of the Good Samaritan, where love was poured out by a Samaritan who was the lowest the most despised who reached out to a foreigner lying on the road may have died without that. Oh Lord God, please forgive us for we've walked by people. We've talked to people. Each one of us, in some way, at some point in time, has had that experience of dealing with those who are struggling materially and who are struggling spiritually, and yet we've provided no help, no support, and we've turned our back. pray, Lord, that you would forgive us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that our spirit would be that which is in Christ Jesus, who was a king, and he considered it nothing to be grasped and held on to and not released, but he came down, and he saved us. He gave us an opportunity to restore our relationship with you, Lord. So, Father, open our eyes by your Holy Spirit and 
change us and motivate us through your Holy Spirit to not turn our backs, to not ignore, and maybe, Lord, to turn our backs on the world and on the trappings and the stuff. Father, we thank you for this day, and we pray, Lord, for this message that's going to come. Lord, that we would walk away changed, that we would grow to understand more deeply your love for us and what that looks like as we love others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, John. Um, we want to take this time right now to uh, dismiss the kids, ages 4 through grade 4, to go to All Kids Church. And are grateful for that opportunity that kids can learn together downstairs. Hey, I want to add my thanks to what Brian said for all of you that were here working so hard yesterday on our day of service. I, I appreciate Pastor Mike and others getting this organized. And man, things look great. So much was accomplished yesterday. Painting and weeding and landscaping and putting down wood chips. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to tell you, if you were here yesterday helping, go ahead and just pat yourself on the back because we appreciate you and all of your hard work. You were like the hands and feet of Jesus yesterday, just saying, look, uh, there's jobs to be done. I want to be involved. I wish I could have been here with you because I love doing that kind of stuff. I had to teach a class yesterday up in uh, Elmira Horsehead's area and then drive back, but we were praying for you and really are pleased with uh, what we see. So thank you, thank you, thank you for loving Jesus and expressing that in ways that get out through your hands and feet to work and serve and be a blessing to others. We are greatly appreciative of that. Okay, so um, you've joined us this morning, and uh, last Sunday we kicked off a new series entitled Lost in Translation, What Our Culture Thinks About Christianity and Why That Matters. And if you remember, we introduced this series by giving a purpose to it, um, my desire and my goal is that I would become a better disciple of Jesus, that I would be a more intentional follower of Jesus, and that I also will be helped in the study of God's Word to be a better disciple maker. And I sense that those are your desires as well. Those are your goals as well, to be a better follower of Jesus and a better disciple maker to be able to share Jesus and the life transforming gospel of, uh, of Jesus with others as well. Here's the problem. Sometimes there are cultural things that get in the way and we think that we are explaining Christianity and explaining God, the gospel clearly but sometimes our actions speak louder than our words and some attitudes and dispositions get in the way and what is meant to be a simple gospel that will proclaim life change in Jesus' name gets clouded and confused and misinterpreted. And we want to figure out some of those things that might become distractions to people in our culture because oftentimes what they think Christianity should be about as they understand it from what the Bible says, is not necessarily what they see being lived out in Christians' lives. Something has been lost in translation. So um, today, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about this particular theme, love in action overcomes favoritism. And I'll put that in the context of where we were last week and then jump into our study in James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. But to get started, I want to illustrate this point of something being lost in translation. Um, something that you expected to say one thing actually said something different. So here's the deal. Have you ever bought a product that totally confused you with its instructions? I mean, you're going to try to put something together, right? And uh, the, these pieces parts are all over the place, and you can't figure it out and the instructions are making no sense at all. Well, I came across some products that had some 
faulty labels or instructions on them as to really what they were for and how to use them. Something got lost in translation, like this one. I love this, pro this one. Uh, you got a problem with mice in your house? You need to buy a four-pack of moose traps. That's what it says, moose traps. Um, I'm not really sure that those little gadgets are going to be able to trap the, mo the mooses in your house, but it's worth a try. Or how about this one? Bottled water. Really? It's in a can. Bottled water comes in a bottle, or at least that's what you and I would expect, right? I, I love this one. Are you dog lovers? We're, lo we're dog lovers. We have three dogs. We, we love our dogs. And so uh, <clears throat> here's this book that's being advertised, Cooking for Your Dog, Tasty, Healthy, and Safe Recipes. Loving on Fido by cooking him good food. But here's the problem. On the local bookstore, on the shelf where this book was displayed, that little UPC tag got slightly misplaced. And so people were buying the book, cooking your dog. Run, Fido, run. Don't be cooked. Something got lost in translation in the selling of that book. Here's one that I think the ladies will appreciate because you like a nice bubble bath, right? And so you want to buy this bath massage thing. That's what it says on the label of the packet. Now, I'll tell you a little secret. I think it's a sponge, OK? It's just a sponge. But it's a bath massage thing. Here's the one I like the best, all right? Guys, perfect gift. Next Sunday is Mother's Day, right? Isn't it next Sunday? So here's the perfect gift. A manicure set for your wife. It comes complete with a can opener, uh, some kind of corkscrew thing, uh, but it is, it, it's labeled as a manicure set. Wow, your wives will be very impressed if that's what you buy for them. A lost in translation manicure set. Well, okay, sometimes those silly th little things happen, but they illustrate the point, right? Sometimes, through best intentions, uh, what we think we're saying or communicating isn't coming out in the right way. And we reference this book by David Kinnaman called Unchristian. And his premise for us as Christ followers in trying to be effective in sharing the gospel through studies that he did in talking to unbelievers, people who are far from God, about their perceptions of Christianity and Christians, he came up with this in studying thousands of outsiders' impressions it is clear that Christians are primarily perceived for what they stand against. We have become famous for what we oppose rather than who we are for. And sometimes the clouded picture of political agendas or alliances or other social things that are happening out there kind of paint the caricature of a Christian that's against this and against this and against this, but what are we really for? Shouldn't that be part of our story? Aren't we for people who are in need of a Savior and want to hear of someone that unconditionally loves them and gave his life for them? And that we can demonstrate the love of Christ that transformed us that can be theirs as well. Now, if you remember last week, we dealt with <clears throat> these topics or these principles out of James chapter 1, uh, verses 22 through 27. We talked about real faith that really works. And we learned from that passage that it is easy to hear the word, but sometimes it's more difficult to do the word. We listen, we take it in, but then when we leave, do we really follow through and practice those things that have been taught to us? We also learn that the word is like a mirror. It shows us exactly who we are and what we look like, the good and the bad. But oftentimes, we look in the mirror, we see what needs to be corrected, but we don't do it. And sometimes that affects our attitudes and our actions towards unbelievers. We know that we should love them. We know we should practice forgiveness. We know we should practice compassion but we fail to ch make the changes that the mirror shows us in our heart attitudes towards those that are outside of faith. Thirdly, it's easy to deceive ourselves by replacing real faith with worthless religion. We think we're doing just fine, 
But remember, James said real religion is this. It is faith that is verified or proven by good works and holy living. James said true religion is taking care of the widows and the fatherless and to keep yourself unspotted by the world's sinful practices, if you really want to demonstrate what real Christianity is all about, your faith is verified by our good works towards others as well as our desire to be separate from sin and live holy. Be holy even as I am holy is what Jesus asks us to do. So, as I said before today, we want to jump into another area that may help us to be better disciples and better disciple makers because we want to think about love in action overcomes favoritism. Love in action overcomes favoritism. Now, in order to understand where we're going with this, we have to set the stage, so to speak, to realize that favoritism can be a problem. In other words, treating people unfairly based on their socioeconomic status or what we think of them on the outside rather than what God wants to do for them on the inside, that sometimes we develop critiques, favoritism or unfavoritism towards others based on only what we see on the outside. But love in action overcomes sinful favoritism. Here's what James says in this regard. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. James, the early pastor of the church at Jerusalem, said this, my brothers, do not show partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. That is a contrasting statement. He's saying you can't really practice biblical faith and practice partiality or favoritism at the same time. The two do not mix. And then he gives an illustration of what he's talking about. Verse 2, if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and another poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in this good place, while to the poor man you say, hey, Stand over there, out of the way, out of the view of other people. In fact, sit down here at my feet where no one will notice you. James asked this question. If we treat people unfairly and practice favoritism based on what we think they can do for us or whether they're up to a level of acceptability in our own minds, he asked this question, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, we're going to come back to this passage at the end of the message and draw some applications for what James is saying. But I want to ask this question, in fact, a couple of questions related to what James just said. Is that what your faith or my faith looks like to a watching world or has something been lost in translation? Are we practicing our faith in a way where we are willing to say, as Jesus said, that God so loved the world that he gave his son? Or do we only really practice our faith towards those that we feel comfortable with? What does our faith look like to the watching world? Do they see Christians that play favorites? Or do they see us, like Jesus, looking at all with great compassion? In fact, here's an important question to consider. Do you think that our church is a place where outsiders would feel welcome? Why or why not? There are indications that the early church struggled with this concept. Hence, that's why James addressed it. He didn't just get up one morning and say, hey, you know, for my morning message, I'm going to preach on favoritism. He actually looked at his congregation and he looked at the culture in Jerusalem at the time and said, wait a second, there are some issues here. They were trying to merge Jew and Gentile together into one body. Misunderstanding. Um, 
uh, Gentiles, Greeks, did not understand the Jewish law. They didn't understand the, the system of kosher food or the, the need for circumcision. And those things were early on in the church being pressed on Gentiles. And they had, they said, why? This has nothing to do with us. And so James is also indicating that there was a certainly a distinction in socioeconomic status, rich people, poor people coming in together. How were they treated? And even Jesus addressed that as well. Favoritism is really a face faith issue. Now let me illustrate this, if I may, by this story called the pit. Um, the pit. Here's what it says. It's a hypothetical situation of a man falling into a pit. And various people that stopped by and looked at this man's dilemma and the solutions or the types of solutions they offered to the man in a pit. So what do you do with a man who has fallen in a pit? This man fell into a pit and couldn't get himself out. A subjective person came along and said, you know, I really feel for you down there in that pit. An objective person came along and said, it's logical that someone would fall down there in that pit. Logical. Um, a person who practiced Christian scientist doctrine came along and said, you know, you only think that you're in that pit. You're really not there. You just think you're in that pit. A Pharisee came along and said, only bad people fall into pits. A mathematician calculated how that person fell into the pit in the first place. A newspaper reporter wanted the exclusive story on the pit. Confucius said, if you would have listened to me, you would, have not, you would not be in that pit. Buddha offered his advice, your pit is only a state of mind. A realist came along and said, now that is a pit. A scientist calculated the pressure necessary to get him out of the pit. A geologist told the man to appreciate the rock strata in the pit while he was in there. An evolutionist said, you know, you are probably a rejected mutant destined to be removed from the evolutionary cycle. In other words, you are going to die in the pit so that you cannot produce any more of your pit falling offspring. The county inspector asked the man if he had a permit to dig that pit in the first place. The professor gave him a lecture on the elementary principles of a pit. An evasive person came along and avoided the subject of the pit altogether. It's not my problem. A self-pitying person said, you know, you haven't seen anything until you've actually seen my pit. Your pit's not as bad as my pit. Someone else said, just confess that you're not in the pit and everything will be all right. An optimist came along and said, you know, things could be worse. A pessimist then came around and said, well, things will get worse. And then Jesus, seeing the man, took him by the hand and lifted him out of the pit. He set my feet on a rock and he lifted me out of the miry clay, the psalmist said. I'm wondering if the kind of advice we give to people mimics all of those other strangers, or are we duplicating the need when we see someone in a desperate situation to offer a hand and help them out of that situation? That's kind of where we're heading in this study. So, Let's break down what James is saying and compare that to another passage in 1 John. Here we go. Here's some things I want you to understand about what James is talking about. First of all, the seeds of favoritism are found in cultural values. They're not found in the Bible. Uh, when we trust Christ as Savior and when we become part of a, a body of believers, we, we don't talk about playing favorites in the church. What do I mean by cultural values? Examples. Oftentimes we treat people based on what we think we can get out of the relationship, right? Uh, what can you do for me? Um, you scratch my back, I will scratch your back. 
In other words, I'm really only going to love and value you if I feel that I can get something back from you. And what James is really saying is that people who have money or knowledge or have the power, in other words, wealth plus knowledge plus influence equals power, and those are the only ones we really want to help. God help us if that's our attitude, if that's our uh, <clears throat> fault line, for not helping people, no matter what their situation is, no matter how bad off they are or how good off they are, they still need Jesus. But if cultural values that we have learned interfere with us interacting with our faith enough to put love in action, we need to ask some serious questions. Why? Here's a survey of the subject of favoritism in the Bible. Because favoritism is not taught in Scripture. Romans 2.11 simply says that God shows no favoritism. It says it very clearly. God shows no partiality. Now that verse is in the context of the previous problem we uh, uh, referred to concerning the difference between Jewish culture and Gentile culture. And God said Jesus actually came to make peace between the two, between Jew and Gentile, to bring them into one. The church didn't exist in the Old Testament, but now, because of the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, he can bring people from all parts of the globe, races, nationalities together. Isn't that what happened in Acts chapter 2 in the early church? All these people, different languages, different cultural values... And they were coming under the influence of the teaching of the Word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, they were being made one in the church because God shows no partiality. Secondly, Jesus set forth a message, an example of acceptance. This comes from one of his parables. You might remember it. In Matthew 20, verses 13 and 16, we, we, we read this account where Jesus replied to them, or about the, the master who is asking people to work. And if you remember the parable, different people work different parts of the day. Now, I thought of this in relationship to, uh, to day of service, and I didn't ask Pastor Mike this question, but you know, I, I think there was a lunch served yesterday, right? Lunch was served. I, I doubt very much that Pastor Mike said, now listen, only you guys that have been here all morning and promised to be here all afternoon, you're the only ones that qualify for eating lunch. You didn't do that, did you, Pastor Mike? With one person, okay. And you know what, they probably deserved it, but I'm not going to ask who it was, okay. But, okay, now he just completely destroyed my point. Not really. What we're demonstrating in this passage is that the, the one who asked people to work and some of them worked all day, and one came at the last hour. Well, let's read what the story says. He replied to one of them, friend, who complained about what he thought was unfair. He says, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me to work the whole day for a denarius? So take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker who showed up the last hour of the day, by the way, this is not Jesus' affirmation on your privilege to show up late for work, okay? Don't tell your boss that your pastor said, it's okay if I show up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you still have to pay me full wage. That's not what this parable is teaching. But what Jesus go on to, went on to say is, am I not allowed to do what I choose, what belongs to me, or do you begrudge my generosity? And then this statement that is often misquoted, misunderstood, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Here's the principle that Jesus is saying. He says, you know what? God is a righteous judge. God doesn't judge the amount of work that you do. He does judge the attitude of the heart. And is it a real sacrifice? Case in point. Some people are saved early in life, and they serve Jesus with their whole life, and what's their reward? They die, they go to heaven, and they hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And some really never 
understand their need of accepting the gospel and they will trust Jesus as Savior, maybe on a deathbed experience or shortly before death. In fact, I think that happened once. There was a thief on a cross next to Jesus who, realizing who Jesus was, called out ahead to him and said, you know, I, I want to be with you. I acknowledge who you are. What was Jesus' response? Son, today you will be with me in paradise. Wait a second, that's not fair. He, he only just now came to faith. And you mean he gets the same reward, eternal life, that someone who was saved early in their life and has served for such a long period of time? Well, the answer is yes. God has no partiality in saving anyone at any time. Now, in case you're wondering about the rewards part, there is some biblical credence and teaching to the fact that those who faithfully serve will receive rewards in heaven at the um, judgment seat of Jesus Christ. But you know what happens to those rewards when we get them? <laughs> we lay them at Jesus' feet. We give them right back to him. So again, this passage, this parable is teaching that Jesus never showed partiality. In fact, he beckoned many to come no matter what their situation in life was all about. Here's a, another passage that talks about this. Uh, our natural pattern is to show favoritism. Remember the, the story of um, Joseph and his father? And uh, Israel, or Jacob, it says, loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he was the son of his old age. By the way, a sidelight, something to learn. Probably not a good thing in family life to choose favorites among your children, Right? Now, kids are going to be different, and kids need to be loved for their differences. They're not supposed to be exactly the same, right? But here, it says that J uh, Jacob made him a coat of many colors, and when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now, am I excusing the attitude of the brothers? No. But what it demonstrates is that when favoritism is showed and displayed, it can wreak havoc on relationships, right? How about this one? John 13.35 says this about how we are to impact people. It says, love for others is the outward transformation of inward, or excuse me, the outward evidence is, let me try that from the beginning. Love for others is the outward evidence of inward transformation. Here's what the verse says. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In order for us to penetrate our culture with a lifestyle that shows love over favoritism, and he goes on to say this towards the end of the verse. In fact, this is the passage that John read for us earlier. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. So here is that principle. Love for others is the outward evidence of inward transformation. Isn't that what John is saying? So, love in action demonstrates the opposite of favoritism. The opposite of showing favoritism is figuring out ways that we can show the love of Jesus by acting out his love in our response to other people. Now, what does that look like? What does it look like to demonstrate love in action? Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 23. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, notice that passage starts with the words Jesus replied. Do you remember what question he was answering? Do you remember what the Pharisees had asked him? They basically said... So who is my neighbor? Who am I really responsible to love or to show love in action? 
And part of the question also involved, you know, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus not only gave him the greatest commandment of loving God with all heart, soul, and mind, but also the second one, love your neighbor. And then he said this, all the law and the prophets hinge on those two commandments. In other words, here's Jesus saying, if you learn how to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing pretty good to follow the principle of love and action that will overcome favoritism because God loves all people equally. Here's how that's fleshed out in the early church. I mentioned that a few minutes ago. In Acts 4, it says, With great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them. There was no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them, bought the money, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as they had need. Wow. That is a great example of love and action. The early church was facing persecution. They had a number of widows. They had a number of orphans. And the church not only loved God, but they found out ways to love each other and demonstrate that love in tangible ways. So here's a question. That's what happened in the early church. Is this what most current evangelical churches are known for today? Some are, some aren't. Here's a leading uh, newspaper article that recently came out on this subject. I won't identify the source, but this editor says this, doing a story on churches in America. Quote, what I find so amazing is the fact that there are still large numbers of people that regularly attend religious services in this country. It's curious to me because many of these, quote, churchgoers seem to blend in among people of no faith. Uh, they don't seem to be more caring or loving toward the fellow humans and, in fact, appear to have very little impact on making society a better place. In other words, he's saying exactly what James said. They're not practicing real faith by loving people and keeping themselves unspotted in the world. He goes on to say, somewhere along the line, the traditional messages of grace, kindness, peace, and love aren't being transmitted to the faithful sitting in the pews it makes you wonder why people go to church at all. Have you been asked that question? Why do you go to church? What difference does it make? Because people that are far from God, sometimes they really don't understand that difference at all. So, as we bring this to a conclusion, let's begin to ask if real, authentic love is the answer to favoritism, then how do you find, define what real, authentic love is? Have you ever asked people, how do you define love? What's meant by love? Well, if you're a country music fan, you probably would be quoting Alan Jackson. It must be love. First I get cold and hot, think I'm on fire, but I'm not. Oh, what a pain I've got. It must be love. Or is it? Is that love? I'm not sure that Alan Jackson's got a corner on truth on that one. You see, here's the deal, friends, and you already know this. Love is not a feeling. Love is action. What if Jesus said, I love you. I really feel for your need as a sinner. But that cross thing, not going to happen. Wow, things would be really different. But he did. He didn't just say, I love you. He didn't say, I feel like I love you. He demonstrated he loved us. How? Actually, this is the passage I think that John read for us, not the other one. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Isn't that how we know that Jesus loves us? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and he demonstrated it through action of going to the cross and suffering so that we might be freed from our sin. Therefore, I really believe that a biblical definition of love is this, seeking the highest good for an individual. What is love? 
It's not a feeling. It's not an ooey-gooey, oh, I've got a fever, and oh, I've got the chills. No! Like Jesus said to us, you've got a problem. You're in a pit. I'm going to reach my hand. I'm going to lift you up. That's how we love as well. Seeking the highest good for an individual. What is best? How can I really help them in their situation of need? Let me give you some examples of how human beings can actually mimic the love of Christ and put love into action. Here's a picture of a great tragedy that happened a few years ago. A commuter train accident in Los Angeles, a tragic event that changed people's lives. Many people severely injured, some lost their lives. When they began to clear the wreckage, they found this in one of the cabs. It's a message that says, I love Leslie, I love my kids. Next to this message was the lifeless body of a man who, they are assuming, trapped in the wreckage and knew he was dying, wrote this final message with his own blood to his wife and his kids. What was he thinking about as he was dying? Not about himself. Not about his bank account. Not about the fact that the boss would wonder why he was late for work. His attention was drawn to those he loved the most. And in his own blood, he wrote the message, I love my wife. I love my kids. And here's what John tells us about that kind of love. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And the last half says... And we ought to lay our lives down for our brothers as well. Wow, that's love. He goes on to say this. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, not just say that we love, but lo let's love with actions and in truth. If anyone has material possessions and sees that, it creates an awareness. And so here's the formula for putting love into action. Ability plus awareness should lead us to action. Let me say that again. Ability plus awareness should lead to action. If we have the ability or the opportunity to help someone and love them and minister to them, and we are aware that they have a need, that ought to be the formula that would motivate us into action. Now, to demonstrate this, let me give you a few examples of that formula of awareness of need leading to love and action. And as I show you these um, examples, statistics, I really thought of about a lot of our ministry partners who are serving around the world and demonstrating love and action in tangible ways. Brian mentioned uh, one this morning in our ministry partners in Haiti, and we've got others as well. But what they are doing around the world in these type of situations we're about ready to look at are also opportunities for us to put love and action right here. For instance, what about the need of food? Did you know that every six seconds somewhere in the world a child dies a uh, child under the age of five dies of hunger every six seconds. Yet here in America, we throw away 12% of the food we purchase. Or this one, water. 1.2 billion people in the world do not have ready access to clean water. Now, I, I know that there's some things in the news about the quality of the water in Mawa, okay? But we'll get through it. Do you realize there are some people that have no access at all to clean water? The average American uses about 100 gallons per day. I've got to confess, I'm guilty. When I brush my teeth, I don't turn the faucet off. I probably should. I'm probably wasting something. Uh, the same situation, 5 million people around the world, not only are those that don't have water, but there are 5 million people that die from waterborne illnesses, and yet we have this abundance of water. Health care. In most of Africa and Southeast Asia, the average is $36 per year for an individual. In the United States, we spend about $3,170 per person on health care every 
year. In Africa, 165 out of every 1,000 children die before their fifth birthday. In the United States, two out of every 1,000 children die before their fifth birthday. So, how do we respond to this? Are they just statistics? Well, it only happens in Africa, not here in the United States. So we can easily say, not my problem, right? Oops. What about God so loved the world? What is our problem? Because if God has a comprehensive, overarching love for all people, and he doesn't play favorites, shouldn't that be our attitude? Whose responsibility is it? Who will answer the call to biblical love and action? Can authentic love and action open doors to the gospel? And my answer is, I think, yes, the Bible teaches us that that is true. Let me end with this quote or kind of end with this quote. We can be the generation that no longer accepts that an accident of latitude determines whether a child lives or dies, but will we be that generation? Will we be in the West, or will we in the West realize our potential, or will we sleep in the comfort of our affluence with apathy and indifference murmuring softly in our ears? We can't say that our generation didn't know how to do it, we can't say our generation couldn't afford to do something about it. And we can't say our generation didn't have a reason to do something about it. So who do you think we can attribute this great quote to? A great church historian or theologian that's recognizing the need of mankind? Actually, this is a quote by a man by the name of Paul David Hewson, also known as Bono, a rock star. And here's the point. If someone in entertainment can understand the social concern to meet people's needs, yet we who know the truth ignore it, what does that say about the character of our love in action or the failure of it? In other words, if we as Christ followers do not demonstrate the love of God to people through good works, Someone else will. Cults? Oh yeah, they're waiting for the opportunity. Politicians? Sure, they'll promise the world and never deliver. They don't have the answer. We do. But people will listen to the counterfeits of false hope in the absence of the real deal. That's why it's so important that our authentic faith turned into authentic love and action really becomes the answer for a world that is in need. So we talked about, <clears throat> um, I thought I skipped, yeah, I guess not. All right, I thought I skipped a slide. So let me go back to that <clears throat> passage in James, and then we'll wrap this up. Here's the solution for favoritism that we can learn from James. Love and action destroys favoritism because faith and fav favoritism do not mix. You cannot show partiality if you are really exercising faith in Jesus. When we show partiality, we are displaying the evil motives of our heart. Have we not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Everyone has celebrity status with God. In other words, everyone counts in Acts chapter 10 when they were trying to figure out how to bring people together from different cultures Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. He actually made that statement after he saw the vision of all of those non-kosher foods coming down and the voice from heaven saying, Peter, arise and eat, and he refused to do so. And God said to him, Peter, that which I have called clean, do not call unclean. That has been broken. No longer need to follow that law. So here's the slide I was looking for before. Closing illustration. Here's a, another ministry partner who wanted to do something about the need of a village in Africa that hadn't had water for months. And they brought in truckloads of water for drinking, for washing, for cleaning. And the reason they brought in the physical water 
was so that they would have an opportunity to talk to people about the living water, Jesus himself. Isn't that what Jesus did? Didn't he, in meeting the needs, the felt needs that people say they have, turn that into opportunities to talk to them about the gospel? Like this one. He met a woman at the well in John chapter 4. Oh, he met her felt needs, her physical, emotional, social needs, her reassurance she'd been married many times. She was an outcast. But when the conversation turned to water that would quench their thirst, he talked to this woman about living water, that if she were to drink of that living water, she would never thirst again. He used those needs to demonstrate and fill her greatest need, a longing to know God and be loved by God. So, what if we met the woman at the well today? What would she be like in our culture? Would she be an outcast like she was in Jesus' day? What kind of needs would she have? Would we try to talk to her, try to get to know her, break down barriers, or would we just ignore her and say, she's really not my problem? Would you show her what Christ's love is all about by demonstrating authentic love and action to her to meet her greatest need? So let's find out. I want to show you a video that is a play on a modern version of the woman at the well and what her greatest need is and how we might be able to meet that need. Let's watch. I am a woman of no distinction, of little importance. I am a woman of no reputation, save that which is bad. You whisper as I pass by and cast judgmental glances, though you don't really take the time to look at me or even get to know me. For to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known, and otherwise what's the point in doing either one of them in the first place? I want to be known. I want someone to look at my face and not just see two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and two ears, but to see all that I am and could be, all my hopes, loves, and fears. But that's too much to hope for, to wish for, or pray for, so I don't, not anymore. Now I keep to myself, and by that I mean the pain, pain that keeps me in my own private jail, the pain that's brought me here at midday to this well. To ask for a drink is no big request, but to ask it of me, a woman unclean, ashamed, used and abused, an outcast, a failure, a disappointment, a sinner. No drink passing from these hands to your lips could ever be refreshing, only condemning, as I'm sure you condemn me now, but you don't. You're a man of no distinction, though of the utmost importance, a man with little reputation, at least so far. You whisper and tell me to my face what all those glances have been about, and you take the time to really look at me, but don't need to get to know me for to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known, and you know me, you actually know me, all of me and everything about me, every thought inside and hair on top of my head, every hurt stored up, every hope, every dread, my past and my future, all I am and could be, you tell me everything, you tell me about me. And that which is spoken by another would bring hate and condemnation. Coming from you brings love, grace, mercy, hope, and salvation. I've heard of one to come who would save a wretch like me. And here in my presence, you say, I am he. To be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And I just met you, but I love you. I don't know you, but I want to get to. Let me run back to town. This is way too much for just me. There are others, brothers, sisters, lovers, haters, the good and the bad, sinners and saints, who should hear what you've told me, who should see what you've shown me, who should taste what you gave me, who should feel how you forgave me. For to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And they all need this too. We all do need it for our own. So here's the bottom line, friends. People need the Lord. People need God, and sometimes they don't even know where to begin to look. Someone who's desperate, they don't even like themselves, and they're hoping that someone will pay attention to them, to know them, to love them, and that's exactly what Jesus did. He said, I want to know you. I want you to know me. And I want to show you what real love is all about. I laid down my life for you. Love in action. Let's keep our eyes open for people that we can have conversations with 
and then demonstrate to them the love of God in the way we act towards them. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for the challenge of your word. Make us different people. Make us people who are open to all people. Help us not to be in any way judgmental based on past problems or sin issues. We've all had them. The only difference is is that we have experienced the answer, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ that invaded our lives and changed us and forgave us. And may that motivate us to see people as you see them, to love them, so that the message of the gospel is not lost in translation. May the truth of the gospel be so apparent in the way we live and act towards other people that people would want to drink of the living water who is Jesus Christ himself. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Let's all rise and praise the Lord with our voices once again. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy.
worship your holy name. I will worship your holy name. Amen. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week.